A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of Allah the Beneficent and the Merciful and I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from across the world Assalamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you I would like to thank you for joining us here on the Ramadan show It is a very sad occasion tonight We're commemorating the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam um, In these nights the Ahlul Bayt are mourning and in these nights we mourn with them I would like to before we proceed and commence into the show just to share one quote, one hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam himself where he says how long is our journey yet how little is our provisions if we ponder over this quote and this hadith we realize that someone as elevated as Amir al-Mu'mineen is already thinking about his hereafter is thinking about the long journey that lies ahead yet we sometimes forget the, the foresight we forget to think about that on a regular basis inshallah we will talk more about this and many other things in today's show During this episode, we'll be looking a little bit closer at the nights ahead, the nights of Al-Qadr when supplications are accepted, when the doors of Allah's mercy opens. These are nights that can make or break our year, can make or break our lives, and can make or break our destiny. So it is very important for us to focus on specific things. For the next three episodes, inshallah, we'll be talking about prayer, salah. It is a very important facet of someone who is a good mu'min, someone who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we attain good concentration during prayer? How can we focus into what prayer really is? Inshallah, over the course of the next three nights, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. If you think about attention, attention is almost, almost like a muscle. As you train your muscle initially, in order to flex it, it may feel quite difficult. And you may not be able to lift as much as you would like but over time as you build it more and more and you train it more and more you will be able to lift more and more heavier things attention is very similar if you focus your attention sometimes after a very short period of time your attention will go away but the more and more you try and focus your attention on a specific thing you'll find that your attention is getting more and more stronger and you're becoming more and more attentive you see from the moment we're born up until the moment we die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom has blessed us with a brain, a mind that works constantly day in, day out, during the day, during the night, every moment, every second. It's constantly working. It's constantly running full of thoughts. So naturally, it is obvious that throughout the day, as you're doing different tasks, sometimes your mind may not be focused on that task because you're thinking about other things because your brain is wired to function in that way however when we look at the Ahlul Bayt and the Aima alayhi salam they all specify and they emphasize on concentration in prayer now the question is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us with this mind where we have thoughts running through it but then the Ahlul Bayt say that actually you should focus in, in, in prayer and not let your mind wander is it practical that we can achieve this? And if so, how can we go about doing this? Inshallah, this is what we shall be covering over the next three nights. Before we talk about strategies that you can employ or strategies you can use in order to try and get the most out of your prayer and trying to attain attention towards your prayer and focus towards your prayers, there's a few prerequisites. 
before you start praying. The first prerequisite, obviously, is the place where you'll be praying. Before you even start thinking about prayer, you must think about where you'll be praying. And you should have somewhere which is nice and quiet, somewhere which is preferably just dedicated towards prayer. Ensure it's clean. Ensure it's empty from pictures or anything else that would distract you. Sometimes it is said that burning essence can be beneficial. There's evidence on the practical application of aromas and fragrances as this is one way to relax the mind, relax the body, relax your emotions. Choose a room which has got a comfortable temperature, which is not too hot, not too cold, so that your mind is not wandering and focused on the temperature and your discomfort. Make sure that the sense of darkness is within the room, so it helps to help you concentrate, helps to increase your focus and your attention during prayer, and also limits the amount of distractions that you can have in the room. Put away any electronic devices, including mobile phones or laptops, because when you have a message that comes through on your phone or a call, even if you may not answer the call, your mind will still be diverted away from your prayers into thinking, who could this call be from? Who is this message from? Like I've said before, the place of prayer is very important and it should be away from any kind of detrimental smell such as food or any other smell from around the house. You should always think about and appreciate, respect your communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the place you choose to meet Him should be somewhere which is appropriate for that specific um, action. After figuring out the place where you'll be praying, it is important to think about your wudu. Wudu is one of the most important ways of preparing yourself for your prayer. It allows you some time to reorganize your thoughts, refocus your attention on the prayer. And also wudu naturally as an ablution clears your mind from shaitan's whispers and allows you to gain some confidence before you go on to the prayer mat. Performing wudu slowly and contemplating on the words recommended during you do the wudu are very important. You think about your life, you think about the journey you're taking, you think about death, you think about your creator in front of whom you'll soon be standing. This way you employ wudu as a specific strategy to get your mind focused just before you come onto the prayer mat. There should be no interval of talking or discussing or, or thinking of worldly affairs whilst you're performing your wudu. And between the time of your wudu to the prayer, try to keep your mind focused on the prayer. Try and keep your mind preoccupied with who you're about to talk to. In authentic traditions, the A'imma alayhim salam used to tremble and it sometimes says that the color of the skin used to change when they used to perform their wudu and get ready for salah. This demonstrate to, demonstrates to us the awe that they had and the focus that they had in their prayer. They realized the importance of not only doing wudu but the prayer. And this is something that we should try and learn from and employ within our day-to-day -day lives. We should try and emphasize prayer within our routines and within our day-to-day -day working lives as well. So now we've talked about how you can prepare yourself before stepping onto the prayer mat. Now let's think of strategies we can employ when we start praying. And during the next three nights, inshallah, I plan to go through a few strategies that you can use in your day-to-day -day lives in order to try and optimize what you get out of the prayers to improve the quality of your prayers, inshallah. So the first Thing, the first strategy that I would like you to employ is to first try and understand the height and the elevation and appreciate that you're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is of great benefit to ponder the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His power, His signs, the mercy that He's bestowed upon you. You see, appreciating His presence 
and appreciating His mercy is a way that you make your heart humble, is a way that you make your soul pure, is a way that you get rid of arrogance and pride from your heart because this is the first step towards becoming humble and having humility in the eyes of your Lord and stepping onto that prayer mat as a servant of your Lord. Next is piety, perseverance and appreciation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you understand His mightiness and you understand whose presence you're going to be under, you realize that this is no small matter. We may pray five times a day, but in every meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firstly, you don't know whether this will be the last time during your life that you'll be able to talk directly to your Lord. And secondly, you have to try and understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, loves the person that talks to him, but at the same time appreciate his elevated status. A good example is from the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and about how he used to treat prayer. He used to give his full attention, his concentration to prayer. He appreciated and knew his Creator well enough to fear his presence and attend with full concentration. Imam Sadiq salam, has said, and he gave this advice to one of his trusted companions, O servant of Allah, when you offer prayer, pray like someone who bids farewell and fears that he will never return. Pray in such a manner as if it was your last prayer. Then fix your gaze on the point of your prostration. If you know that there is someone on your left or your right, you take more care in offering your prayer. Then know that you stand in front of someone who sees you, but you do not see him. As we move on to the next strategy that you can employ, in order to try and get the most out of your prayer. When you step onto the prayer mat, in your mind, always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always ask Him, constantly talk to Him and beseech Him to try and make you obedient towards Him at all times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, when he went on Mi'raj, whosoever acts for my pleasure, I give him three characteristics. I teach him gratitude, which is not polluted by ignorance, remembrance that is unadulterated with forgetfulness, and love that takes preference over the love of creatures. When, then when he loves me, I love him and I open the eye of his heart to my majesty. I do not keep my special beings hidden from him. I converse with him secret, secretly and in the dark of night and in the light of day until he ceases talking with me and sitting with the creatures. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that if you have purity in your heart and if you have the sincerity in your soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that he will also come towards you and give you the ability to realize his elevated status so that you may come closer and closer to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, I make him hear my talk and the speech of my angels. I make my secret known to him, which I have kept hidden from other creation. I dress him, I dress him in modesty until all the creation is, of awe, or is in awe of him. He walks on the earth and all his sins are forgiven. I make his heart hearing and seeing and I do not hide from him anything and I do not hide from him anything of the garden of the fire. I make known to him the terror and affliction awaiting the people on the day of resurrection and about the things I will question the rich and the poor as well as the learned and the ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that if we ask him and ask him with sincerity he will open the secrets of this universe open the secrets of the earth, heavens and the secrets of the earth for us he will tell us the secrets of the hereafter but the only thing we need to do is be sincere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say I will make him sleep in peace in his grave I will send Munkar and Nakir to question him 
he will not experience the sorrow of death or the fright of prelude of the next world of, of the next world then I will erect his weighing scale for him and will unroll his book of deeds I will then put his book on his right hand and he shall read it unfolded then I will not keep any interpreter between me and him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that between you and him there will be no intermediary there will be no middle person because the love that you have for him and he has for you is such that he will talk to you directly finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so these, so these are the attributes of the lovers O Ahmad make your concern one concern make your tongue one, one tongue and make your body i.e. your person alive that is never oblivious of me whoever is oblivious of me I do not care in which valley he perishes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us come close to me and I will come even closer to you but forget about me and leave me follow the worldly desires follow the worldly creatures and that is where you will end up you will not have a future in the hereafter and in this world you'll be unsuccessful as well inshallah tomorrow as we progress further we will talk more about the strategies you can employ in order to optimize your prayers once again I ask you on this night where we commemorate the martyrdom of, of Amir al-Mu'mineen not to forget us in your prayers inshallah The Holy Prophet Muhammad may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny has said, Eight Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy. Its middle is forgiveness and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. During the shows and during the episodes of this show, I've been talking about places around the world and how they prepare for the month of Ramadan and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And my research has taken me to many, many places across the globe. Today, we talk about another place in Europe. We've spoken to uh, a Shia in Oslo and they've told us how they spend the month of Ramadan and what sort of challenges they face. For those of you who don't know, Norway is a country in Northern Europe. It's a country in Scandinavia. Scandinavia has two very distinctive times of year. Time of year when it's extremely dark and the sunlight hours are very few hours. And this time of the year, in the summer, when the daylight hours are so long and the night hours are very short, the sister explains to us that in Oslo, the time for iftar falls at about 11 o'clock at night and then imsak is at around quarter to one. So that leaves them about an hour and 45 minutes to open their fast, have their food, to pray and to have suhoor. For many people, they find this an extremely challenging time of year. So much challenging that they find that fasting 22, 22 and a half hours in a day and only having one hour to eat and to replenish their energy stores is just too physically demanding. And therefore, many people over the past four years or so have been traveling out of the country during the time of the month of Ramadan. Obviously, for those people, they intend to pay back the fasts. But due to the harshness and the extremes of the climate there and the weather conditions and the daylight hours, they see it fit and they see it appropriate for them to make that decision. Obviously the food that they eat and their day-to-day -day programs depend upon the culture they're from, the background they're from. And the other thing that the sister said to us was that due to the fact that there are so few hours in the day for iftar, many people, and, and obviously because it's so late in the day, many people choose to stay at home for iftar and only go to the mosque when it's the night for A'mal or when there's special du'a that is being recited on one of the nights of Qadr. 
other than that, people tend to stay at home because iftar is quite late at night, so 11 o'clock. And many people, due to the fact that it's a, a, a non-Muslim country, have work the following day. They may have school the following day. Little children may even be asleep by that time. So for them, it's a very difficult uh, proposition to go to the mosque after iftar time. Like I've said, and like I've requested before, it would be great if you at home could send in your pictures, your videos, even anecdotes and blogs about how you spend the month of Ramadan and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, your working hours, your daily lifestyle, how you prepare for iftar. And inshallah, we look forward to airing those videos exclusively here on Imam Hussein TV. Rahman Rahim, dearest brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you. Today we have come to one of the restaurants in the holy city of Karbala, which is known as Rukn al Sultan. Stay tuned as we go inside this restaurant and show you the atmosphere of the holy month of Ramadan in this specific restaurant. Mm -hmm. السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة. ممكن تعرفنا بحضرتك آه علي القزويني احد مؤسسي مطعم ركن السلطان آه ممكن تتفضل عن طبيعه مطعم ركن السلطان الصالات اللي يحتوي بها طبعا احنا عندنا صاله هاي للعوائل وصاله مشتركه وصاله خ... آه صاله ثالثه وصاله الفي اي بي براذر سيد علي القزويني ون اوف ذا اونرز اوف ركن السلطان ريستورانت I asked him about the halls that they have. They have three halls here, uh, one specified for the families and one VIP and one for the general public. Naam Sayyid, can you tell us about the atmosphere of Ramadan in the city of Karbala and what is the difference between the rest of the year? Of course, Ramadan is a great day for the Karbala and the Iraq. And God will finish us, inshallah, from the end of the year. And, alhamdulillah, we have a special Ramadan for Ramadan. For the rest of the days, it's a request for the menu to come to the menu. ويطلب الطلب بالنسبة لرمضان إلى خصوصية أكو طاولة رمضانية اللي تكون من عصائر ولبن ورطب وذني إنه شغلات الأخرى زائد إنه يكون البوفيه مفتوح مجموعة أكلات من ثمانية إلى أحد عشر صنف يوميا موجود عدا المقبلات الزبون يختار جزء من عدين أو يشكل من جميعهن وهذا إن شاء الله صوم البوفيه Uh, I asked Brother Sayyid Ali about uh, the restaurant and the differences between the holy month of Ramadan and other days of the year. He's saying that the, uh, during the other days of the year, uh, the restaurant is open and they serve three meals. But during the holy month of Ramadan, they have a very unique meal for the iftar. The, the foods that they serve here is open buffet and the visitors can choose from the variety of the foods that Rukhna Sultan provides. They have from seven to 11 types of main dishes uh, beside the appetizers and the desserts.
During this episode, as we talk about medical health tips and advice, inshallah, today I want to talk about something that a lot of people have and they complain of. It's a symptom that many of us throughout our lives have at least had once, and that is headaches. There are many different sorts of headaches, and headaches generally can be caused by different things. So it's really important that you realize what headaches are, what sort of headaches there are. And secondly, if there's any sinister signs that you see that I'll tell you about, it's very important to get them checked out by a doctor. Headaches have been around since the beginning of mankind, I presume. It's something that is natural within our being. To get a headache can be caused by many, many different things. Things, something, things such as dehydration, stress, even things like being exposed to a bad smell, being in an environment which is too noisy, they can all cause headaches. And often these headaches are, are, are completely uh, benign and they won't cause any long-term problems. So I'm just going to go through very quickly the different types of headaches that there are. And secondly, what I'm going to do is ask you to look out for specific things, specific symptoms that if you have them, they should probably go and get checked out. Primarily headaches, the most commonest type of headache is called a tension headache. People can get a tension headache from many, many different sorts of things. Mainly it's linked to a stressful lifestyle. But other things such as lack of sleep or dehydration can also cause this type of headache. Tension headache usually affects the temples on both sides and usually is eased by rest or by sleep. Usually, simple painkillers such as paracetamol can help with the headache. Many people who have stressful jobs, I'm sure, find that they have these headaches on a very regular basis. And they have measures in place which can help to control them. After that, one of the other most commonest forms of headache is something that we call migraines. I'm sure many of you have heard it without knowing what a migraine sufferer goes through. Migraines exist in a very variety, varied uh, forms and basically what happens with people with migraine is that they get a severe headache which can be accompanied by certain symptoms or maybe they're in isolation. Migraine sufferers usually say that there is specific triggers that start the headache. Some people say that things like cheese or chocolate or caffeine can precipitate the headache. However, in many people there is no precipitant, it just comes on suddenly. And when they get the migraine, some people have an aura. An aura is basically visual symptoms or other symptoms that someone would have who will then go on to develop a migraine. And these symptoms can be very subtle or they can be very profound. People can lose complete vision in one eye or complete vision in, sorry, half vision in both eyes. Or they can have zigzag patterns in their vision. So this aura is something that's a phenomenon that is associated with migraine. People who suffer from migraines often say that the migraine is so grating to their minds, to their brains, that often they can't stand any smells, any visual stimulation such as lights, such, any auditory stimulation such as loud sounds. People with migraines usually feel nauseous and sick. And they can also, sometimes people with the severest forms of migraine, they can also feel or get weakness on one side of their body. If you suffer from that sort of migraine, and it's something that's never happened to you, if you do find that you're getting weak on one side of the body, please don't just um, ignore it. It is a very serious symptom. It can be a symptom of stroke. So if that's the case and you're getting this headache with a, with, with a loss of movement on one side of your body, please go and see a doctor urgently. Another form of headache can be something called um, cluster headaches. It usually happens in men and usually they find that several times of the year they get headaches in clusters where they get very profound headaches for a period of time, maybe half an hour, one hour. What usually happens is that they have a, a pounding headache on one side and they usually water or they have tearing from one eye. The eye goes bright red. And these cluster headaches are so profound that he wants to make them feel like they want to bang their head on a wall. Now, notice how this is different from a migraine, where a migraine is more prolonged and it can last for several hours. 
A cluster headache usually lasts for a much shorter period of time. And rather than wanting to be in a quiet room away from any stimulation, people who have cluster headaches usually want to go somewhere and hit their heads. Very different sort of headache. And people who have cluster headaches, I suggest you go and see a doctor simply because the medications that you need prescribing need to be prescribed promptly. Other sorts of headaches that affect the elderly specifically is something called temporal arthritis or giant cell arthritis, which is basically inflammation of the, of the temporal artery which runs on the temples on both sides of your head. Now, other symptoms that these people could have, if they get headaches on the, on, on the head, if they, if they press on the temples, they get the severe headache. And when they brush their hair, for example, the headaches uh, come back and they can reproduce that headache by, by brushing their hair. Other symptoms that they have are pain in the muscles around the shoulder because temporal arthritis is linked to another, condi another condition called polymyalgia rheumatica and people who suffer from polymyalgia are usually going to develop temporal arthritis so if you suffer from temporal arthritis please go and see a doctor straight away as soon as you can because one of the long-term consequences of temporal arthritis is loss of vision or blindness. The next form of headache that I want to tell you about very quickly is benign intracranial hypertension. So in very young, especially young girls who are of adolescent age, they sometimes get a headache which changes with their posture. It is very important that these girls are seen by a doctor because usually this is caused by high pressure in the brain. If you get headaches which are very severe and they're pounding and they change with position, they change with whether you stand up or you sit down, I suggest anyone who has these symptoms goes and sees a doctor because it may be a sign of a very benign, non-sinister headache, but some people with masses in their brain or cancers can sometimes get headaches like this. Other symptoms to look out for when you're worried about cancers are things like loss of movement or loss of feeling on one side of the body, loss of vision, loss of normal functions of the brain such as loss of hearing. It's very important to identify these as what we call red flag symptoms. If you have any of these symptoms, very important that you go and see a doctor as soon as possible. There are many other types of headaches, but I don't want to go into them too much because it will become too much for this particular episode of the show. But what I want to say is for headache sufferers, it's very important that you're able to get on top of the headache find ways to cope with the headache, whether you suffer from a migraine and you take medications such as paracetamol and anti-sickness tablets, or whether you take something called sumatriptan, which is, or other sorts of triptans which are specifically designed to take when you have a migraine, just before you have a migraine, and they tend to ease the headaches. Or whether you have tension headaches and you take simple painkillers like paracetamol or ibuprofen, whatever you find helps you, it is very important that you persist with that. Because when you have a headache, it preoccupies your mind. It takes your focus away from other things you could be doing. And in the long run, it's detrimental to your health, detrimental to your mental ability or mental status, and it can also be detr detrimental to your spiritual status. Inshallah, even though I've not really touched upon many facets of this particular topic, I've given you a very brief outline of different types of headaches and things you can do when you have these headaches. It would be very interesting to see what your thoughts are, what your experiences are. Please join in in our online debate on Twitter by using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. If there's any questions you have, inshallah, as a doctor, I will also be reviewing these comments that you make. And if there's any place that I can aid you or help you, I will endeavor to do my best. During the ruling Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, there were two travelers who sat together on the way to the destination to eat a meal. One had five loaves of bread and the other had three. A third traveler was passing by and was requested to eat with them. The travelers 
cut each of the loaves into three equal pieces, each of the travelers ate eight pieces of that loaf. At the time of leaving, the third traveler took out eight dirhams and gave it to the two men. On receiving the money, the two travelers started to argue on which, which, which one would receive the most amount of money. The first loaf, the first man had five loaves and demanded five dirhams. However, the man with the third loaf didn't accept and wanted an equal share. They brought their argument to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib who decided to decide between them. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib requested the three loaf man to accept three dirhams. The man refused and said that he only would take an equal share. At this, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said in return, you can only have one dirham. You, you had eight loaves between you, between each of you. Each loaf was broken into three parts. Your loaf was only three, so it made nine, and the other person had five, making it 15. Altogether, made 24. Your three loaves made nine parts, leaving you with just one, because you gave the traveler only one loaf, and you ate seven, and you ate nine, sorry. Your friend had five loaves and divided into 15 pieces, gave seven to the traveler, and in return the traveler had eight. And when you count it as such, the guest shared only one part of your loaf and seven of your friends. So you, had to, you, so you only have only one dinar to, for your return, and your friend should receive only seven dinars. As we've approached the nights where we remember the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, we remember different qualities that he possessed, the teachings he left behind for us, the guidance he showed us. One of the main things that he taught us was that we should always look after the orphans. After all, he was known as the father of the orphans. Me and my brother Abbas have written one nasheed, one poem called You Are Not Alone which is dedicated to orphans from all over the world. They're going through many trials and tribulations and insha'Allah, as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we should be there for them. You were standing in silence all alone Like a bird your dreams have flown And there's nowhere left to go you were standing with no one by your side You were drowning with the tide And there's nowhere left to hide When you've lost your family and friends And you've got to that dead end Now no one gives a hand when you've lost all meaning and all hope Now life's just a downward slope You don't know how you cope Just remember you are not alone Cause God is there with you When your world falls down around you you don't know what to do You are not alone There comes a time When there's darkness all around When you're crushed into the ground And the light cannot be found There comes a time There's an emptiness inside when your dreams and goals have died And you think you can't survive When there's no one to wipe away those tears And ease all of your fears When you lose someone so dear 
when there's no one to turn to you and smile when you face so many trials now nothing seems worthwhile just remember you are not alone because god is there with you when your world falls down around you you don't know what to do you are not alone because god is there with you when your world falls down around you you don't know what to do you are not alone we pray we pray we pray we pray for peace for you we say we say we say we say we're there with you when you're down and out you're filled with doubt we hear your cries the cries of your heart we're there through the highs we're there through the lows we are by your side we'll never let you go you are not alone because we are there with you when your world falls down around you you don't know what to do you don't know what to do Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, Eight Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy, its middle is forgiveness, and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show, I want to leave you with a final thought. A few words to get you thinking, a few words to get you contemplating and reflecting, because these are the nights that you need to be reflecting and contemplating. Those words are that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you everything, you would not appreciate what you already have. And this is so true for a lot of things in life, not only materialistic things, but even specific traits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be ambitious. He wants you to have goals in life. And it is only when you have limitations and weaknesses and things that you don't have quite yet, that's when you set goals for yourself to achieve those. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be proactive and not stagnant. I would like to ask you humbly to remember us in your du'as on these nights, these nights of power, the nights of Al-Qadr. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all your du'as and your legitimate desires. I would like to once again remind you to send your videos, to send your photos, to send your blogs so we can see how you're spending the month of Ramadan. And finally, I would like to ask you to please join us on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram and on YouTube. Finally, I would like to bid you farewell with these following words. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.